we're trying to replace that with is a bunch of different pieces of code running in the same domain, non-interfering except through public APIs. So the arrows in uh, the lines on the right side are uh, just normal object references and function calls. So that's how uh, cajoled pieces of code, and cajoling is a term that we use when we rewrite to JavaScript. And so a cajoled code is the, the code with security guarantees. So once, once they're cajoled, they interact just via normal JavaScript function calls. So something that JavaScript programmers are very used to dealing with. And um, the uh, foundation for um, what we're doing is called object capabilities. And object capabilities is an extension of object-oriented programming that um, uh, makes it you know, very easy to reason about the security properties of a piece of code. And it works on top of uh, reference-safe languages. Um, Java is, for example, is a reference-safe language. You can't just go and cast a number to a pointer. So you know, if you reference something, it's because you've gotten that reference by some other means. Either you created the object or it was passed to you. Um, An object uh, capabilities adds a couple further restrictions. So um, objects are encapsulated. They're only accessible via their public API. Only if you intend to expose something, you know, only the, the ways in which you ex uh, intend an object to be manipulated are the ways in which it's manipulable. Um, and uh, all influence on the outside world is via sending and receiving messages. So there's no, you know, raw access to the file system. There's no um, system calls uh, with direct access. Um, and you can deny access by simply not providing references. If you need to re uh, reason about what can this piece of code do, you just reason about, you know, what objects can it access. If I don't want it to access a file, you know, I just, you know, don't pass in a file object. And it builds on good uh, software engineering practices. So, uh, for example, separation of duties. A lot of times when you're writing a piece of code, you break it up by what this is what each piece of code needs to do. If you're trying to build a secure system, you want to make sure that a mistake in any one area is not going to um, kind of allow cascading breaches. It's not going to allow somebody to, to gain um, all kinds of authority. And so if you separate uh, this piece of code from that, this deals with the file system, that deals with the network, um, then so, a breach in one place isn't going to allow, you know, necessarily uh, somebody to exploit both. Um, and uh, dependency injection um, is a way of uh, separating, uh, I guess, the implementation of inputs from, you know, the code that takes them as inputs. Um, with authority injection, um, the way in which you grant authority to a piece of code is by passing a reference. Um, and object capabilities uh, is, in many ways, uh, a lot more flexible than static security policies. And what I mean by a static security policy is um, if I wanted to uh, allow access to a particular file, I could say this program has access to only these files. Whereas uh, if I'm doing object capabilities, it's all about passing in the references. So if somebody wants to delegate authority, they simply pass that reference on, and the piece of code that is dealing with a file system uh, doesn't have this static policy, which prevents uh, delegation in many cases. So. And so you've probably all seen uh, Google Search. It's a box with a button. And uh, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that uh, you can write code and have two mutually suspicious pieces of code uh, interacting with one another. And one piece of code is the search box. Um, it has access via the Google Ajax search APIs to um, our web search. And so I can search for um, and get back a bunch of results. And you know it can manipulate a small part of the DOM so that it can, it can display its results to the user. Um, and that doesn't look like cats. But um, well, that doesn't look like cats either. But 
there's this other piece of code, which apparently is malicious right now, um, <laughs> that, is, uh, that is, is taking, it receives a message, which, which result I clicked on, and it gets passed in a result object, and then it does an image search. And it's supposed to display pictures of kittens, but uh, it doesn't seem to be doing that right now. Um, and uh, and um, this is kind of the overall architecture. We we rewrite JavaScript, CSS, and HTML, and so we take in a bunch of inputs, which are various file types. Um, those get turned into parse trees. And then each of these boxes in the middle is a transformation from parse trees to parse trees. So we take HTML parse trees and we strip out the parts that we can't prove safe. Um, we take in JavaScript and we do similar kind of validation and rewriting. Um, then we turn the HTML into something which looks roughly analogous to document.write. And so that turns into JavaScript, which will produce the same HTML, but uh, in a limited context. And what we end up with is, uh, we, we end up with is a JavaScript parse tree and a CSS parse tree. Um, and those can then be embedded in the page. And this is meant to be an extens extensible system. So if, for example, you wanted to, and a lot of clients uh, have their own um, steps that they need to, to go through. If you wanted to, for example, rewrite macros in JavaScript, you could throw your own uh, uh, processing stage into this, which would take the parse trees that uh, it cares about, rewrite them, and throw them back in the bucket of parse trees for the next, uh, for the next consumer to deal with. Um, and the, the search gadget that I showed you earlier, um, this is uh, some of the code in it. So it's specified as a chunk of HTML. It looks like normal HTML. It loads some script, it loads some CSS, and then it has a bit of, of HTML that actually specifies the form. Um, and the first thing we do is we look at the script tags, we look at the link tags, we look at the style tags, and we pull out the various pieces of information that we need. Um, and we go and we, and we also go into uh, event handling attributes, such as on click, and we pull the um, script out of there and place it with a stub, which we'll call through to the, uh, to the safe version of the JavaScript. Um, we do some uh, rewriting of CSS style rules to prevent uh, collision. Um, if one gadget wants to uh, define a style rule which says the p tag is purple, and another gadget that wants to define a style rule which says the p tag is pink, then we need to make sure that, you know, even if they're in the same page, one gadget's uh, style rules don't uh, affect the um, DOM nodes created by other gadgets. And so we put a class on the beginning of each of the style rules and effectively namespace them that way. And um, once we've got JavaScript, once we've got everything boiled down to JavaScript, so we've taken the HTML and, and turned it into JavaScript, which produces that HTML, we then need to make it safe. And uh, again, you know, we also want to, to make sure that uh, there's non-interference. And so in, uh, in JavaScript, the window is effectively your global scope. Um, we create a, uh, a separate global scope and we rewrite all global references such as document to um, the fake global scope that we create and we call that fake global scope outers. Um, and this also allows us to put ourselves in the middle of interactions between the JavaScript and the browser. So the document is, uh, an inherently unsafe object. It allows you to you know, create script tags, set the source, muck around with them, all, any, any number of ways to arbit uh, ex execute arbitrary um, script. And we can create our own document which has the same API um, as the original, but that allows us to uh, 
you know, enforce certain policies. Um, and uh, the container then loads the gadgets um, since the gadget is compiled down to a parse tree of, of JavaScript and a parse tree of CSS. We include a script tag and we include a, a link tag to, to load each of them. And then um, we create the global scope. So we create the global scope and then we set up the fake uh, document and uh, then we load the safe JavaScript and CSS. Um, and in the uh, demo, the uh, gadget used the Google Ajax search APIs. Um, that, of course, uh, requires a lot of access to the network, but we don't want to allow direct access to the network, and so we in inject an authority into each of the gadgets. Um, we create a search engine object which has a very minimal public API. The public API basically says, uh, here's something I want to search for, here's a callback to invoke once you get the results. Um, and then we just assign that object as a member of the global scope. So since this is the outers object and we're assigning the search engine member, then um, they just say search engine and it appears to be something in their global scope to the gadget. And uh, I guess that's about it. Um, questions? Um, we do the compiling uh, on the, sorry, I'll repeat the question. Um, the question was, this, uh, this works really well in a, in a compiled environment, um, but JavaScript is an interpreted language, and, and, and uh, how does it affect performance there? Um, the, the answer is uh, we, um, we run the cajoler uh, on the server. The cajoler is written in Java, um, and then uh, the way a lot of containers work is they have this thing called a gadget directory. And so uh, you've probably seen iGoogle. Um, you can choose a bunch of gadgets to embed in your page, say, you know, I want my news feed here, I want this here, that there. Um, and uh, so there's this gadget directory, which is, is basically a cache of, um, you know, gadget source code. And, uh, and that cache uh, now just includes, you know, the cajoled source code as well. Um, and uh, that actually gives us a lot of flexibility in deployment. So, you know, if we find a security problem after the fact, we can just go through and flush that cache. Um, as far as uh, the performance of the actual JavaScript, um, we are inserting runtime checks. So we do, uh, this is a, a fully whitelisting approach. Um, when you go to an object and, and, and you want to, to run a, uh, execute a method on it, unless we can prove that you know, that method is something safe, then we need to check whether or not, you know, uh, you have access to that member. Um, so, for example, on Firefox, every object has an eval uh, property, which, uh, you know, allows you to do just about anything. Um, and so that is something that we did not whitelist. How do you handle calls like eval or dynamically generated JavaScript code? Um, we don't do that right now. Uh, there is... Uh, the question was, how do we handle things like eval and dynamically generated JavaScript? Um, right now, we do not. Uh, the Kaha language is a subset of JavaScript, and we've defined another subset, Kahita, which is something that is, <laughs> which is something that is very easy to uh, to verify client side. And so that's a superset of JSON, uh, but with functions, um, it excludes things like this, um, and. Uh, and, and so that is, that is something that we can, we can parse and verify, uh, you know, efficiently client-side. So what other efforts are you aware of that do this, and can you compare and contrast this with the other approaches to? Um, uh, the question was, what other efforts are there in the same area? Yeah. 
Um, there's Doug, uh, Doug Crockford's uh, AdSafe, which is a verification-only approach, that they don't rewrite JavaScript. They just look at it and determine, yes, this is safe, or no, this isn't. Um, that's also a blacklisting approach. Um, and uh, you know, blacklisting, if, if you're blacklisting, you're, you're depending on, and you know, Doug Crockford has done a huge amount of work in, in, in making sure that he's, he's gotten this right. Um, but uh, there's less flexibility with that approach. Um, and you're also relying on the blacklister to have thought through everything that you know, could possibly go wrong. Um, and there's also Jacaranda, which um, uh, hasn't, I haven't seen a whole lot of details on it yet. That is uh, a much more uh, kind of object-oriented approach. So it's trying to take a subset of JavaScript, remove the prototypical aspects of the language, and, and present um, a purely class-based language. Um, and uh, I don't know enough about the language to comment, but um, since we're trying to, you know, our target audience is, is people who, uh, developers who are familiar with JavaScript, HTML, and, and one of our goals is to present the same set of tools, um, we wanted to, you know, continue treating JavaScript as a prototypical language. Uh, FBJS. Yeah, um, FBJS is Facebook's uh, version, and they are, uh, you know, doing something similar. I believe it is. Uh, a, is it is that a whitelisting approach? No, it's, black it's a it's a black blacklisting approach, um, and they do the similar kind of rewriting of global references to point to something else, so that they can then interpose, uh, <laughs> you know, their version of of document. So are we going to wind up with you know, six or seven of these things out on the web? Well. Uh, you know, we've, we, we're trying to uh, present, um, the answer is probably yes in the short term. Um, and, and the question was, are we gonna end up with six or seven of these on the web? Um, in the short term, I think so. Um, we're trying to present the same API that people are familiar with, uh, or, you know, or substantially the same API. And so, you know, we're not, we're trying to avoid the burden of everybody learns a completely new language. Um, and so, you know, they can leverage everything they know about, you know, JavaScript and CSS and so on. Uh, if I can interject, we're also uh, in, in active communication with Gr Doug Crockford trying to resolve uh, differences between AdSafe and Capita. Uh, a couple questions. Um, one, how do you parse the JavaScript? First question, how do you parse the JavaScript? Uh, we wrote our own parser for JavaScript, CSS, and uh, HTML, XML, you know, Markup languages. If you're actually looking at the construct, it's not just like a simple regular expression. No. Okay. Yeah. It's a real parse tree. Yeah, yeah. We generate proper parse trees. And um, the since we wanted this to be an extensible tool chain so that people can put their own, you know, JavaScript optimizers, obfuscators, and so on onto the end, uh, what we do is we take all these parse trees and then we shove them into a bucket, and then we have a pipeline. Each pipeline stage says, you know, I know what to do with HTML. So, you know, I'll take all the HTML and maybe, you know, turn them into JavaScript parse trees, which, you know, I then just shove back into the bucket. Um, and so if somebody wanted to, uh, you know, parse um, FBML, for example, um, they could uh, put a markup, uh, a parser for that, you know, onto the front. Um, that would produce FBML. Then, you know, you have something that takes FBML, turns it into JavaScript. I don't know how you would do that. but. Um, and then, you know, would just take those JavaScript parse trees, dump them back in the bucket, and they would be then picked up by the next stage that, that cares about JavaScript. Third party libraries? Yeah, All right. Dojo. And and what was your third question? Um, actually, that, All right. Um, uh, the question was, how do we handle third party libraries? Um, and we've gotten a lot of questions about uh, jQuery, Prototype, Scriptaculous, YUI, um, you know, any number of other libraries. Uh, we're dealing, uh, we're in, uh, we've, we've been talking to John Resig of jQuery a lot, and we've been talking to some of the Prototype folks. Um, taking a library that, that, that makes a lot of assumptions about the environment and, and tries to present uh, it is, you know, some of these libraries we can get to cajole, um, jQuery, for example, uh, you know, is, is, is very particular about not extending um, native objects. Uh, so it doesn't add members to object, it doesn't add members to function. Um, prototype does that all over the place, and that presents some problems because um, when, 
uh, you know, if, if, we're, if we're assuming non-interference and people are adding things to object.prototype, that's going to affect every foreign loop of a gadget that doesn't do that. Um, there's tricks we could do with, I, with iframes to, you know, create a new window, which gives us a new version of, of object. Um, and, you know, there's other tricks that we can do with that. And, and, and we've kind of, uh, I don't know, what have we actually settled on for jQuery, for, for a prototype? We're, we're, so we're going to, the, the decor, Ben's decoration mechanism. All right. Uh, well, I should mention the particular issue of object.prototype, that's, that specific uh, object, prototype takes pains not to decorate that one. All right. But it does decorate array.prototype, for example. All right. Um, and, uh, yeah, so uh, object decoration is, is where just, you know, de uh, control w when something is created, we go and inject the extra, extra yeah. fields into it. All right. Um, Would it not be possible to push a lot of this functionality actually into the browser so that you can have sort of like instead of a script source equals whatever, you can do script source equals whatever, safe equals true or something like that? Or uh, type equals text slash kaha. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we, uh, so I mean, like, so could you like hypothetically build like a Firefox extension to do this? We, we've 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 talked to some uh, we've talked to some uh, interpreter developers, um, and and one of the things uh, kaha does not include the with construct, and it and it does not allow uh, modification of the arguments array. Um, and uh, those are two things that make it very hard to uh, optimize uh, JavaScript. Modifying the arguments array means that, you know, if a function can reference its caller, it can actually change that caller's local parameters. Um, and, 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 and without those two restrictions, uh, interpreters could, so it's possible that in the future interpreters might recognize that a piece of code is um, Kaha and, and be able to execute it more efficiently. Um, but uh, I, you know, I, I don't know of any, we're, we're not planning any, change, pushing any changes to the HTML spec um, at this moment. Any other questions? Uh, let me. Um, what are you doing about the HTML sanitization? Are you following the HTML5 rules or how to do with that HTML? Yeah, um, HTML, uh, the question was, uh, what are we doing about HTML sanitization? Uh, specifically, are we using the HTML5 rules? Uh, HTML5 is a is um, it's a it's a great piece of work. It's kind of a codification of uh, these are the ways uh, browsers actually deal with you know tag soup. Um, so it has uh, you know browsers you give them just about anything and and they'll you know interpret it some way and and, and over time they've come to interpret it pretty consistently. Uh, yes, we are using HTML5 uh, to generate our parse tree. Um, what we put out. Uh, is um, when, what we put out is 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 consistent. Um, we also have a client side sanitizer so that when you assign uh, node.innerHTML, um, it'll get sanitized unless it's you know something that we know a priori is safe uh, safe HTML, um, and uh, and and that um, uh, is not HTML5 uh, compliant because we didn't want to rewrite an entire browser um, in JavaScript. So, yeah. so. Uh, you said that there's no this, so can you do prototype-based class coding? Uh, the question was, you said there's no this. Um, that's in Kahita, which is the subset of Kaha that we want to be, that we plan to, uh, to use to implement uh, a safe eval. Um, uh, Kaha allows this. So, and, uh, Uh, the question was uh, of existing gadgets. Um, uh, will most of them cajole? And if they don't, what do gadget developers need to do? Um, and uh, I, the main uh, blocking factor to having uh, many gadgets cajole right now is our partial, uh, you know, we, we implement this fake document. Um, and we haven't implemented, there's large parts of it that we just haven't implemented yet. Um, and I think uh, the main, most of the problems that people have right now will be working around, you know, uh, the parts that we haven't implemented yet. Um, and uh, um, uh, for example, right now we haven't implemented uh, 
proper sanitization of styles. Um, and so, you know, that's going to be a, a large area. Uh, sanitizing styles in JavaScript is hard just because CSS, uh, we're, we're using CSS 2.1. CSS 2.1 is a big language. Um, and so uh, we're planning on providing uh, kind of uh, templates of styles and, and various other ways to manipulate styles, but setting, uh, you know, doing set attribute on style right now will not work. Um, is there a question? Were you talking about the uh, architecture graph? Let me see if I can't remember where I put that. Um, and and uh, what was your question? Which does it include? I'm sorry. Uh, we don't we don't do obfuscation right now. And was there? All right. Is that all the questions?